Okay. Okay. We're rolling. All right. This is an interview at the Division of Military and Naval Affairs Headquarters, Latham, New York, the 29th of October, 2003, approximately 10.30 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, John H. Vonskoik, John Hardwick Vonskoik. Uh, I was born in Schenectady, uh, November 3rd, 1920, uh, and was raised in Cobleskill. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what was your education prior to entering military service? Uh, high school, 1938, from Cobleskill, uh, RPI and Cornell, uh, a year each. Okay. I then, um, uh, I then worked uh, in steel mills and uh, a foundry and was working at GE uh, in, uh, on a steam valve improvement project for the Navy at the time uh, World Pearl Harbor came along. All right. Uh, with Pearl Harbor, do you remember where you were and your reaction to the news? I was, uh, I was listening to... Uh, during the day, after I found out the news, we were listening to uh, Sidney Bechet at the log cabin in Yoast. Uh, I heard about Pearl Harbor when I went to pick up my friend who wanted me to take him over there to, to hear Sidney Bechet. He was a jazz saxophonist and, yeah. and was yeah. very interested. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I was readier to go than he was. He, he wanted to hear more about Pearl Harbor. He had 2400 vision I had. 2020, I was waiting to go in the Air Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, did you enlist or were you drafted? I was, uh, I signed up in uh, the summer of 1941. So I was waiting for orders at the time of Pearl Harbor. All right. And when did you uh, go into service? I went on the 29th of December, 1941. All right. Where did you go for your basic training? Went first to Montgomery, Alabama, uh, then uh, Dothan, Alabama briefly, then down to uh, Arcadia, Florida, where I had... Uh, I had basic uh, primary flight training, then uh, Sumter, South Carolina, Shaw Field for uh, basic flight training, and Albany, Georgia, uh, Turner Field for uh, okay, what, advanced. What type flight. of uh, planes did you receive your basic? Well, PT-17 in the primary, uh, BT-13A in the uh, in the basic, and uh, there were three planes: the AT-6A, uh, the uh, AT-17, and the AT-9 at uh, the advanced uh, flying school. Okay. Um, I then went to, uh, at the McGill field uh, for, uh, for operational training uh, with uh, B-26s, the uh, B-Dash crash, the mm -hmm. Martin did, murderer. Did you want to be a bomber pilot or a fighter pilot? Or? Uh, they, uh, they selected me. Uh -huh. uh, they took the tall people for, uh, for bomber pilots and they took the short people for fighter pilots. It was very, uh, very simple. If you were over five feet six or under five feet six, and if you were between five six and five eight, it was a toss up how many did they need. Okay. Now, I, I know I, I looked through your, your book, and uh, you seem to like the B 26. The B 26 was the airplane that had the great prestige. If you were flying a B 26, you were a <gasps> guy, you were something else. Whereas if uh, you're flying any other kind of bomber, hey, you're just a bomber pilot. Mm -hmm. So there was, uh, there was a kind of a glamour attached to being a B-26 pilot, simply because it was so dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was uh, killing a lot of people. At that time, uh, it was a uh, time when the Air Force was expanding uh, between 41 and 42 mid-year, uh, what, five times. And uh, in the meantime, the war had come along and, and units had been moved overseas with skilled people and those people were maintaining the planes overseas, and the people who were maintaining the planes in the States were trying to find out how to do it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the pilots were trying to learn how to fly them. So, and so the aircraft controllers were trying to learn how to control them and all that sort of stuff. Were the accidents more uh, mechanical uh, failures or pilot errors? Combinations of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, there, was a, uh, there was a change in the 100-octane uh, uh, gasoline. Uh, which was caused by the need to increase the the output, and uh, they put a lot of more aromatics in the uh, in the gasoline mix. The aromatics affected the natural rubber seals in the carburetors and things of that sort, and so you got uh, you got problems uh, attached to that kind of thing. Uh, the B-26 was a new plane with new engines, new propellers. There were lots of opportunities for shakedown uh, problems, mm -hmm. and they had them. 
and uh, you put uh, that together with uh, with a seven day a week flight schedule for each plane. Each, every plane was on a 24 hour a day, seven day a week schedule for flight. If it was ready to go, it flew, and a plane and a crew was put on it to fly it. And uh, that meant that uh, that the plane was being stressed. The uh, people who were trying to maintain it were being stressed. The uh, uh, crew chief on one plane that I flew several times uh, had been in the service 16 weeks when he became a, 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 a crew chief in charge of the airplane. Mm -hmm. This is a 15-ton <laughs> airplane with, with all kinds of crud and uh, stuff in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was uh, uh, 16 weeks out of service where he'd been a shoe salesman. They hadn't even pulled him out of a garage for a mechanic to, to, to make him into a, an aircraft uh, crew chief leader uh, as a mechanic. And he had three unskilled men he was trying to train on the job. Uh, he didn't know what he needed to know. We didn't know what we needed to know. We almost got killed one time because the airplane always had a, a what uh, might be called on shipping a manifest. It was the A1 a form. And you looked at that when you got in the plane and you saw if there was anything unusual that was supposed to be written up. We went up and it was badly loaded because we took some passengers along. And uh, we found out when we came back down on the ground after almost getting killed because of the weights and balances. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, uh, that uh, there was 200 pounds of sand in the tail that had been put there to balance it against the weight distribution ordinarily, which would have been experienced when people were doing transition, where there'd be three people up in the cockpit and nobody else. And so we find out on the, on the ground afterward that this sand is there, and we've got these sightseers who are sitting on the piles of sand in the tail to look around and see. And it was uh, a, a very dangerous situation. Simply nobody's fault. We didn't know what was wrong when we found out the plane didn't fly right. We tried to find out. We finally decided that maybe it was the balance. Pulled some people up front and everything was fine. But in the meantime, we could have been killed. So uh, it was a combination of inexperienced people and over, over scheduling of the planes. Ordinarily, they'd be scheduled two or three times a week. And they were crewed by five or six people, all of whom were regular, you know, regularly trained and skilled. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that. And so uh, with this new plane, which was a hot plane, uh, the B-25 came in to land at 130 miles an hour. The B-26 came in at 140, just 10 miles an hour hotter. Uh, it uh, uh, wouldn't take off. Under, well, it wouldn't fly safely on single engine until uh, you had about 160 miles an hour. Uh, it uh, it took, took you beyond the end of the runway to get, uh, <laughs> to get that fast. You'd be in the air, but you couldn't stay on one engine mm -hmm. uh, if an engine gave out. I had an engine cut out at that point and start to go on the slow roll because the, one, the good engine starts to pull you over. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I cut back on the power to crash straight ahead under control and uh, the other engine cut back in again. So we went ahead and do our flight. But uh, it was uh, cold and we were <laughs> halfway over <laughs> at the time that uh, I could get my hands on the throttle to, because it was <laughs> that fast. Yeah, very fast. Now how did you flew both the B-25s and B-26s. Yeah. Um, could you compare them for us as to... Uh, yeah. Uh, B-26 was heavier. It was more luxurious. It, it sounded better. It, uh, uh, you, you felt you were in a Packard. Uh, it's against being in uh, some kind of a tin Lizzie. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the B-25 was probably a far better plane for the South Pacific. Uh, it, uh, it was more adaptable. They turned them into attack planes. They put uh, uh, machine guns in the nose and made them into stra strafers. A very dangerous kind of uh, kind of flying, as far as the crew was concerned. Uh, but uh, we flew a lot of those kinds of missions and lost a lot of planes that way. But uh, it also did a lot of damage to Jap airfields and Jap aircraft, and uh, that was, of course, the purpose. Which so, did you personally prefer? <laughs> I preferred the A-26 partly because I, I, I met my wife while I was flying it and married her six weeks later uh, while I was still flying it. Uh, people got killed around us, but we didn't 
and uh, of course she didn't lie ever in, ever in it. But uh, uh, it was uh, it was coupled with uh, a young man's testosterone and that kind of thing. Uh, so where where did you meet and when? Oh, that was in Fort Myers, Florida, where I was in uh, operational training. Mm -hmm. uh, while I was in transition training, uh, within a couple of weeks of the time I got down there, I saw her across a crowded room and uh, tried to make her and uh, you know make eye contact, and uh, it didn't work. So I found out she didn't have her glasses on. Uh, otherwise, it would have been quicker and easier. <laughs> but uh, her mother told her never never wear your glasses on a date. I told her I didn't make passes at girls who didn't wear glasses, and so she put them on. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it was uh, p partly sentiment. Mm -hmm. uh, I recognize now very clearly that the A25, the B25, was a far superior uh, plane for our purposes in the South Pacific, no question. Uh, but uh, the B25, uh, B26 was a good airplane for Europe where it was used for what it was designed to be, a medium altitude bomber. And it took a lot of, uh, a lot of hits from the, uh, the German 88mm uh, uh, guns, uh, which were better at tracking than, uh, than the Japanese. Uh, the Japanese uh, couldn't track very well at medium altitudes. Uh, the transition for a, a, a transit for a uh, for a B-25 or B-26 was too fast for them to track well and get good uh, uh, good sighting and uh, bomb cutting or shell cutting. So they were much better at 20,000 feet where the uh, B-17s and the B-24s flew. And uh, they, t they took some flak hits. We very seldom did. I got shot down by flak, but uh, it was an accident. Uh, more an accident than it was Japanese skill. Where uh, did you eventually pick up your, your crew and did you stay together? Oh, I, I picked up the crew at, uh, at uh, well, well, it was just, just before the day I got married to her. And uh, it was uh, a crew of uh, five men, two officers and three enlisted men, all staff sergeants, who were assigned to me. Uh, the uh, uh, co-pilot was, uh, was a man named Richard Mogford. And he was to be with me only long enough to get uh, trained in flying the airplane. And then he would get a crew of his own and I'd get a new co-pilot, as was the case with all of our group. And uh, so I had to be, uh, I had to do transition training for him at the same time I was doing uh, uh, operational training with the crew. And then uh, we got the new uh, co-pilot. Uh, uh, those, that crew went with me to the South Pacific and were with me in Fiji until about June of 1943 when the co-pilot and the navigator were taken off and assigned to a different squadron to fill their table of organization. And uh, uh, my, uh, my three enlisted men stayed with me until, uh, until January of 1944, no, March of 1944, when uh, I managed to get them an extended leave in uh, New Zealand on rest leave and uh, had to start flying missions and they gave me a new crew. And uh, so I had uh, the, a new radio man, gunner and engineer for the last 20 missions I flew. When did you leave for the Pacific? I left for the Pacific on February 1st, 1943 and I came back on about June 5th of 1944. I was over about 16 months. Um, Longer than usual. When you uh, went overseas over to the Pacific, uh, did you fly or...? Yeah, we got out, to, uh, got out to San Francisco and the uh, ATC uh, Transport Command uh, was supposed to fly us down to the South Pacific and they were experiencing a shortage of seats and uh, after we were there for maybe three weeks, and they sent a couple or three of our crews, uh, four, four or five uh, out of 15. Uh, they decided that the remaining pilots uh, and part of their crew should go down to Long Beach and check out in B-25s and fly B-25s overseas and do the ferrying uh, and carry themselves. And so my uh, engineer and uh, turret gunner were sent overseas along with the celestial navigator. They didn't trust the, my navigator to get us to Hawaii. And so they, uh, they gave me a, a ATC navigator, Bill Shower, 
who, uh, who was very good, and uh, a second lieutenant, but a very capable guy. And uh, we checked out in Long Beach, flew up to Hamilton Field in uh, Marin County, California, and then uh, uh, flew the flight. It was a 12-hour flight to, to uh, Hickam Field in Hawaii. That was uh, kind of horrendous because uh, uh, the Sperry, uh, the uh, not the Sperry, uh, the uh, Holly carburetor that uh, that was used on the uh, right uh, cyclone engines in the B-25 had the old rubber seals in my case, and uh, we had some trouble with the right carburetor and uh, had to run it in full rich mixture for a while until we changed altitudes and I could thin the mixture down some. And with bad winds, the combination uh, put us in there with uh, 15 gallons of gas remaining of 1,585 start, starting load. It was uh, kind of close. And we were uh, skipping on the downwind leg until we put the flaps down and then uh, uh, the nose went down and the gas flowed again and we got down on the ground. But, uh, that, was, that was horrendous. <laughs> Now, did you keep the same plane, or did you... Uh... No. Uh, the, that plane went to the 69th Squadron. I, uh, I managed to get myself and uh, the other B-26 pilots who went with me, there were three others, uh, got uh, transferred to the 70th, which, uh, which was uh, a B-26 Squadron uh, in a composite... Uh, well, at that time, there wasn't a group. It was only, uh, only the two squadrons isolated. Uh, but uh, then a group headquarters came down with two more B-25 squadrons, and ultimately the B-17s, the B, the 70th Squadron, became a B-25 squadron by sending all those B-26s down to the Fifth Air Force. So uh, when I wanted to combat, it was in a B-25. Never did fly combat in a B-26. I, I flew patrols. Did you uh, ever get to name a plane? I had, I had the opportunity to name a plane and didn't do it. I thought it'd be uh, uh, name if, if the plane had the character, it would name itself, and it didn't. So I didn't fly it all that much anyway. Was there as much? Uh, was there much uh, nose art and so on in the Pacific? Much what? Nose art, painting the, the oh. noses <laughs> of the planes. People so like that, don't they? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a question. You uh, if you if you look at the back cover of my book, you'll see a. Uh, a plane, a B-26, uh, with its nose on the runway, yes. and uh, I put that there. It was uh, Paul Ryder's uh, B-26. I'd been assigned uh, a, a B-26, which he put in a ditch, and then uh, then I uh, dropped his uh, down. But uh, if you notice the peace terms was the nose art. Uh, uh, Raven Hawkins uh, gave him uh, uh, the art. Uh, he says, uh, one of his uh, crew, I think he's bomb bombardier, uh, it was the peace terms, and uh, uh, it was Uncle Sam with his pants dropped and his bare ass out. And, uh, and behind him uh, was kneeling Hirohito, ready to kiss uh, the uh, protruding end of, uh, of Uncle Sam. Uh, so uh, I, I, I always liked that piece of art. It was, it was cute. Um, what did you wear? when you were flying? Yeah, we, we had summer flying jackets, uh, which we ordinarily wore. Uh, it was uh, at, at uh, 12,000 feet, uh, even in the tropics, you, you get uh, pretty chilly. And uh, so uh, we, uh, we wore cockies mm -hmm. and uh, then the, uh, the summer flying jacket. Uh, no scarves, no Snoopy scarf. We, uh, then, uh, then later on, they gave us flak jackets, and uh, since I'd had uh, 35, 40, 45, I've forgotten how many missions by that time, I wasn't about to be uh, worried about whether somebody would think I was a coward if I put on a flak, a flak jacket. So I put mine on, and, and the other officers did, but these new uh, people I had were uh, diffident about wearing them, and so I had to issue an order that they wear them. And uh, uh, but uh, they could fly their missions as privates if they preferred, uh, but they would wear their flight jackets otherwise. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so the first mission, when they wore the flight jackets, uh, a piece of shrapnel, uh, maybe this big, uh, pretty close to a pound in size, uh, came through the open hatch, side hatch, uh, ricocheted off the, uh, the turret post and uh, hit, uh, hit the radio man in the chest right around the solar plexus. And uh, it was dented the flak suit uh, plates and uh, he, he felt that it would have killed him, which it would have. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, everybody in the squadron was wearing their flak suits. <laughs> but I was very pleased that I had taken the, the precaution to order them to wear it. I said, if, if, you, if you're afraid of being thought chicken, okay, it's because you're afraid of me. <laughs> now, where were you uh, based, or did your base move oh, we, around? Oh, we, we moved forward as, uh, as the war moved forward. What was the range I, of the uh, 25 Oh, well, we, fl we flew four-hour missions, which would be about 400 miles, 450 miles maybe. Uh, it, uh, it was fairly short range. I think we could have, uh, could have stretched, but uh, some, of the, uh, some of the planes had uh, better uh, flight fuel characteristics than others, and uh, uh, they, they simply kept the missions down to about, uh, about two hours each way. Uh, and well, well Flying at 11,000 feet, you're doing 240 miles an hour, uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's in still air. And uh, we oftentimes had tropical fronts to go through and so on. Uh, I, I did fly missions that were four hours and 40 minutes long, uh, which uh, stretched the fuel reserves a little bit. In one, one case, I had to go into Torakina Point on Bougainville Island early you know, and land there for fuel, uh, just because I wasn't sure everybody could make it back. Mm -hmm. How many missions did you fly? Flew 47, and uh, 26 uh, armed patrols. Uh, the uh, the uh, armed patrols didn't count as strikes, the 47 did. The reason I was uh, low on strikes, the, the other three guys that uh, were comparable to me uh, had 52 or 53, depending on which one. Uh, but I would, I'd been sent to, uh, to New Caledonia to train crews uh, for some five or six weeks. And uh, during that time, I missed out on strikes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the major said, I'll, I'll make up as best I can, and I'll send you home with the other guys. And that made me feel better. Now, did you have a, a number of missions you... Well, ordinarily, accomplished yeah, they, they, had, they, had a point system. they had a point system for rotation. And uh, uh, this varied. It started in and then rose uh, as they discovered that people didn't, uh, didn't drop dead. If they went 25 missions, then they started them 35, and they went up to 50. And they, uh, they had a combination of hours of flying overseas, number of months overseas, plus a number of strikes. Mm -hmm. And uh, they changed the system of computing it uh, every time they wanted to raise the requirement. Uh, they changed the system a little bit, and then uh, then you'd have a little higher barrier to get over. But uh, that didn't affect morale all that much. It, uh, it wasn't good, but uh, it was the best they could do. I think everybody understood. Uh, and uh, as long as you didn't think you were going to be dead the next day, well, you didn't worry too much about it. I think if it had been a real, really hectic, <laughs> people might have gotten, uh, gotten upset. But, uh, what was your targets and most of your missions? Oh, we, uh, we hit airfields uh, as long as we could reach airfields that the Japs uh, had airfields on. Uh, one of the things that happened was that as we came into range, they began pulling their airplanes back because uh, once, uh, once we were within range, in addition to worrying against the, uh, the uh, high High altitude heavy bombers. Uh, they they knew they had really had it when we got in range, and so they'd pull back. So we very seldom actually did attack airfields. First attack or second attack, and uh, the Japs had pulled back. Uh, barges, small boats. Uh, that's uh, up to 500 tons, say, uh, which were used for by the Japs for supply and naval targets, uh, where the uh, the other major targets that we had. Uh, so we, we'd, uh, 
going strafe and bomb some some cove somewhere that uh, uh, the intelligence told us or the folk, coast watchers told us the Japs had uh, bombs or barges pulled into during the day, and we'd go up there and we'd strafe and bomb it and, and presume that uh, maybe we sank something. And we never knew what we'd done, but uh, apparently we did a lot of damage because uh, the post-war assessments uh, showed uh, uh, showed the heavy damage to the Japs uh, in these kinds of attacks. Did you ever uh, do any skip bombing? Uh, I did a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. I uh, I don't think I ever did actually uh, actually do any for real. Uh, the Jap uh, we didn't uh, hit the uh, Jap fleet when we hit Rabaul, and they pulled out as soon as we began hitting there. And uh, no, I, I don't think I ever did do a. I, I can't think of any particular case. What happened in, in the mission that when you were shot down? Oh, uh, oil tank on the right engine got uh, got punctured down low, below the standpipe that uh, holds the reserve for feathering. So uh, we. Uh, now you said you were hit by flak. Yeah, one? yeah. It was a, it was a pretty good bump. I think it was probably about a probably a hundred and five millimeter. Uh, and a, uh, well, I guess the, the Navy was, uh, was guarding that field. Uh, it was Bona Canal. And uh, they, were, they would have had some five or four inch guns. Uh, it was a pretty good bump, and uh, it put some holes in the plane, including this one that hit the oil tank. And uh, so we started losing engine oil. And uh, that was what we used for, uh, for uh, feathering the propeller. So when the, uh, uh, there were Japs, in, uh, bogies, uh, Japanese zeros in the area, and uh, so I kept the, uh, kept the engine unfeathered and using that engine until we got out away from, uh, from the Japs. They, they'd attack stragglers, and the idea was uh, they'd gang up on stragglers. So we got back in the formation in a hurry and stayed there streaming oil while, uh, the, uh, while we could. And uh, when the uh, engine uh, oil pressure gauge showed that uh, we were losing pressure, bang, I hit the feathering switch and the, the propeller went to feather position. And, uh, but kept creeping. And as it crept, uh, slowly it uh, began, the gears began working and uh, turning the blades so that they caught the air a little more and a little more. And so the RPMs went from practically zero to, uh, to maybe one a minute, <laughs> to, uh, uh, to two a minute, uh, and three a minute, and so on, until it got up to about 20, 2,800 RPMs. And at that point, the, uh, the nose gearing uh, broke loose, and uh, the propeller was wobbling and, uh, and, uh, and turning at some kind of speed, which uh, it was, was enough of a, enough of a, uh, speed and wobble that it uh, beat back the cowling of the engine uh, and uh, was shaking the plane so it felt like the plane was going to fall apart so I decided it would be better to ditch. So we uh, ditched, uh, landed the plane in the water uh, and uh, got out and got in the life raft. And when you touch, touch down, how fast do you think you were going? Probably about 110, 100 maybe. Uh, we uh, we were uh, uh, throttled back on the uh, good engine and we were holding off, mm -hmm. and so maybe it was even lower than that in the speed. Uh, it was uh, it was landing speed, and sometimes you land a little faster than others. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I can't really can't really guess what the actual touchdown speed was. Maybe it was as slow as 70 miles an hour, but uh, we were shaking pretty bad. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure any instrument would have told us much. Uh, then the, uh, the uh, bum, Dumbo, uh, it was a Catalina uh, PBY, uh, had been uh, circling in the area of the Rabal Harbor area. Uh, in case anybody went down there, they would fly in and land in the harbor and pick somebody up and bring them back out. And uh, this crew had been circling there, and at 100, and 100 knots or whatever it was they flew, uh, we were so much faster that we were pretty nearly back to base by the time we had to set down. And uh, so they, we had to wait for 
almost an hour for them to get to us. But uh, they did and landed, open sea landing. Now, did you radio your location prior to landing? Oh, yeah, or? sure, yeah. Uh, we had uh, we'd already had a uh, an emergency uh, ETA for uh, uh, for uh, Dane Base on Bougainville Island. They knew we were coming, and then uh, when we decided we had to set down, the radio man uh, uh, did what he the procedure called for. He uh, signaled them that uh, that we were setting down and what our location was, and then he taped down the key, and uh, so that when we actually sat down, their location finders could uh, could be looking at us and. Uh, and uh, following our transmission. So uh, we sat down and uh, that was maybe a two or three minute time at the end. I was about 2,000 feet in the air and we had to get down by that time and it slowed down of course to do it, uh, down to about 160, mi 160 miles an hour and, uh, and uh, cut back on the power. Uh, and uh, So uh, it, things were very routine. Uh, they, they were Routines had been set up for doing this kind of thing, so that uh, there wasn't anything really uh, emergency about it. It was sort of, uh, sort of the way things operated. The uh, crew was a New Zealand crew that had. Uh, we were our, their first pickup, mm -hmm. and uh, so we were an occasion for them. Uh, they were cooking steaks in their galley and offered us food. I, I wasn't hungry. <laughs> I never was hungry when I was flying a mission. But uh, the other guys had some steaks with the <laughs> with the uh, New Zealanders on the way back. <laughs> then we go to the Coos Bay, and the Coos Bay made us comfortable and and washed our oily clothes and uh, gave us other clothes in the meantime. And we sat in the wardroom and drank coffee. I had a a friend, my father's friend, uh, was on Sterling Island in the Treasury Group where we were based, and uh, he always used he was the field electrician and. Uh, uh, he always watched me go off and watched me come back, so I had to get hold of the uh, the signalman on the Coos Bay and get him to radio uh, the uh, uh, the CBs and and tell my friend that uh, that I was okay. <laughs> he said uh, later he'd been figuring what he would tell my father, <laughs> explain what had happened. <laughs> now, how long did it take uh, uh, from the point? You hit the water until the time. Oh, we were about 55 minutes before the plane picked us up. Uh -huh. And uh, then it was another uh, uh, 55 minutes or so to get back to base. And uh, we landed in the harbor of the you know, Sterling Island, Mona Island, uh, between those two islands, mm -hmm. uh, which was the basically what the Treasury Group was, and the only two main islands. And uh, landed right there in the bay. And so we were practically home by the time we got there. Well, how long did it take for your plane to, to sink? Did it totally go under? Oh, <laughs> a couple minutes, three minutes. Uh -huh. so, I guess about three minutes. Yeah, any idea? It slowly, it slowly went down, and it went down by the nose, and then the tail comes up, mm -hmm. and then slides down. Any idea how deep the, the water is? A couple miles. Oh, that deep? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's pretty deep water. Uh -huh. uh, maybe it wasn't that deep. Maybe only four, maybe 4,000 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess maybe it was 4,000 feet. It was about five degrees south and uh, 154 degrees east, something like that. I think I put it in the book. Said uh, you, you wrote on your form that you laughed a lot and drank as much as you could. Uh, what did you have to drink? We were short on beer. <laughs> as much as we could it was uh, it was uh, pretty seldom. Uh, at sometimes, and sometimes we had a pretty fair supply of one thing or another. Mm -hmm. uh, we managed, we, we, more than the Navy, the Navy had everything else over us. They, they had refrigerators, they had ice cream machines, they had all, all kinds of things. Uh, the one thing that we did have was airplanes that we could fly in liquor from. If, we, uh, if there was a, a liquor load unloaded anywhere, we could go there and get it. And so we managed to have liquor sometimes, uh, gin or, or whiskey that, uh, that the Navy didn't have. And we could, uh, I could entertain my Navy friends with, with uh, that. They had, to, they had to buy island juice, which would be about 150 proof, but uh, 
I think, I think I remember my friend spending $35 for a seven ounce Coke bottle full of island juice one time. What did you mean when you said that uh, you laughed a lot, but your laughter was not deep but up front? No, well, you had to pretend you were enjoying yourself. You know, it's, uh, nobody was really happy. If, you know, everybody wanted to be back home. They uh, were waiting for it, and they were expecting they wouldn't get killed before they did it. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, you have to you have to live. And you have to uh, have to go on, and uh, that's all it was. You uh, said that someone that uh, you best remember was from Fiji. You made a civilian friend there. Yeah, I called him up in in two thousand two. I was in Fiji for the first time. I hadn't seen him in 58 years. And uh, I made a phone call and managed to locate him. I said, semi law law? He said, yes. I said, this is John Monskoik. He said, where are you? I said, Fiji. He said, is Sally with you? <laughs> she was. And we went and we had lunch with him. Uh, he's a village chief now. His father died. And so it's a hereditary thing. Uh, from Nandarovatu. How did you become friends? He was uh, he was a busboy uh, or a, a orderly, I guess is the military term. He was an orderly in the uh, in the uh, officers' club in at Nandi Air Base in Fiji, and uh, he and I got talking, mm -hmm. and uh, he told me a lot of things about Fiji, which were accurate, and uh, uh, he borrowed my hunting knife one time. He was going to go on a weekend party uh, of some kind with his friends and uh, he borrowed my knife and brought it back uh, next time he came in sharpened clean obviously had been cared for and uh, he borrowed it a couple times more uh, and he, he said to kill a cow and I guess they roasted this this animal and had a big big feast mm -hmm. And uh, it seemed to give him a certain amount of prestige, or at least pleasure. So when he uh, when he said that he was uh, he had a job with Bish Limited over in uh, uh, Suva, uh, I took off the knife and handed it to him as a present uh, to remember me by. And he was very much embarrassed because he didn't have a present for me, which Fijian custom calls for a present begets a present. Mm -hmm. And I told him that was different. That was his custom. Our customs weren't that way, mm -hmm. and so I didn't. I didn't need a present reply. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, wrote me later. He cared for it, and then he wrote me that he it had been, it had been stolen. He was working in the gold mines then, and uh, uh, somebody had come into his room while he was asleep, and had taken it from where it was hanging on a nail on the wall, and he said it felt as though he had eaten some kind of poison, that it had. had uh, had hurt him so to lose this valued present. Oh, well. I told him it would not destroy our friendship that he had lost the knife. Now you mentioned that your colonel um, was not allowed to fly and there was not allowed, Yeah. He wasn't allowed to fly missions, but you yeah. didn't Apparently, fly with you. Why, why was it that he wasn't I allowed pond to? I've pondered that to some degree. Uh, he was a famous football player. He had been a All-American at uh, at West Point. And what was his name? His name was uh, Harry Wilson, the light horse Harry Wilson. The sportsman called him, and uh, apparently he was a pretty good running back. And uh, in in our squadron, and in the 69th, they said he'd been tackled too many times. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he he never really made it with the men. Uh, but uh, I think maybe. Partly it was because he was so famous they didn't want to have his name attached to failure of some kind. Uh, there, there was also the fact that the command uh, didn't want to have to replace valued commanders, mm -hmm. people who could uh, assemble missions and uh, send them out. Uh, and uh, so my, uh, my own squadron commander and the operations officers were only allowed to fly five 
rather relatively safe missions, they got themselves their air medal, which is what the cost was, five strikes and you get an air medal. And then they were uh, grounded. Uh, Wilson wasn't even allowed to do that. And so uh, at, toward the end of his time overseas, uh, he apparently uh, felt he just had to have some missions before he went back to the States. And uh, uh, I was, uh, I don't, I never figured out quite why he picked me, but I think maybe it was because my, my commanding officer, Major Doherty, knew me pretty well, knew I could keep my mouth shut, and uh, uh, figured that, uh, that maybe I was the person to have him approach. And so he gave, I think Doherty probably gave Wilson my name. And Wilson came into briefing one day, and uh, I was, I'd been scheduled to lead the group. And uh, here he comes. He says, uh, I want to fly this mission with you. I'm under orders, orders not to do so, but uh, I want you to uh, put your own co-pilot's name on the A-1 form as the person flying the mission. And uh, well, that was asking me to, to falsify a flight record, which was... Uh, not a simple, a minor thing, but I said, if uh, if you will initial the form, uh, okay. And so uh, when we finished and came back, uh, he put a little W there on the form where I told him what to do. He made it very inconspicuous. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I also, uh, at that time, was so, so disillusioned with things, and I knew that uh, what was going to happen was going to happen. Uh, thinking hey, this is what it's like to be a veteran, uh, so I uh, I just stopped stopped bitching. People uh, people bitched, but uh, I didn't. They asked me one time why didn't I? I said, well, I'm a mercenary, and uh, uh, I signed on for for better or for worse. And they're paying their paying me the money. They're a little bit late this month. The payroll's three weeks late, but uh, but they'll pay me eventually. And uh, uh, they're doing their part. Uh, they've promoted me. They didn't pro promise to promote me. Uh, gave me uh, allowances for a wife that they gave me an opportunity to meet and marry. Uh, I don't have anything to complain about. Well, my best friend heard that. And he thought that was a pretty good idea. And he said he'd be a mercenary too. And he shut up. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, after you <clears throat> accomplished all of your missions, what was your assignment? Oh, I came back to the States, and uh, there was a uh, almost a problem in the States. Uh, they had, at first, people had come back, and uh, they usually hadn't had all that much combat. And they would be then reassigned to squadrons as leaders in the squadron to go another squadron, another tour overseas. Uh, by the time I came back, uh, I'd been kept over a lot longer than I wanted to, but probably it was a good idea for me, for my long-term best interest, because uh, while I was away from my wife for an extra four months, it was also a period during the war when the war matured, and uh, they weren't really needing to send people like me back overseas, mm -hmm. uh, but they were needing to train more people for going overseas, and they were find, finding slots for them in training. So I, uh, I became a transition, uh, or no, for a combat crew operational training instructor at Columbia, South Carolina, and B-25s. And after two or three months, we found out that the A-26 squadron was being, or group was being assembled down in uh, Mariana, Florida. And a friend of mine and I applied for transfer there. And so we went down and did the same thing in, uh, in Mariana, Florida. For some reason, I don't know why, along in the spring, after Germany gave up, uh, a lot of the uh, paddle feet, uh, the uh, non-flying officers, uh, were uh, asking for relief from service. They knew they didn't have any future in the regular army because they didn't have wings, any kind of aerial rating. So they were getting to ask to go back to, to be released from active duty. And uh, uh, Colonel Steed had come in there to replace the non-flying officer who'd been commanding officer on the field. And for some reason, he picked me uh, to be a squadron officer and uh, administrative officer and then a squadron commander 
of a, uh, a squad of an administrative squadron. It was an assemblage of uh, people who had various kinds of duties, from uh, meat cutters to, uh, uh, to tower operators, <coughs> and uh, 432 men, as I remember, at the peak. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was a administrative uh, squadron officer, squadron commander, uh, which was a good experience for me. Uh, he, he told me he was trying to uh, to get me. Uh, to be in the military, a regular officer, I think, uh, for some reason, he, he thought uh, thought I was good. Uh, I've wondered why. At one time, after he named me, he asked me, uh, "Did you ever have any uh, relatives in the military service?" And uh, I told him, "Yes, my uncle Lou had been in, and uh, uh, that uh, my uncle Lou had served in the Philippines." Well, he wanted to know about Uncle Lou, and I told him he died just after being released from Bilibid Prison, and uh, he said. Uh, he had the Congressional Medal, didn't he? I said, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't have put it forward, excepting that uh, it was asked. Uh, Harry Wilson asked me that one time, too. Apparently, in the regular Army, this, uh, this was one of the few old medals. He got it in the Spanish-American War. But uh, Steed had been very down, very low in his class, and had taken five years to go through West Point. My Uncle Lou had flunked out twice and never had graduated. But had gotten the Congressional Medal before his classmates graduated from from uh, West Point, and uh, so I, and then I found out uh, recently when I was writing this book that uh, that Seed had actually served in uh, the Philippines at a time at the end of my uncle's career when he was the top military person in the Philippine government. He was uh, what amounted to a military consul for uh, Teddy Roosevelt and the High Commissioners who succeeded him until 1935, and they overlapped about two years. So Steed knew my uncle, and maybe that's why I got to be this squadron commander. Nepotism without, <laughs> without knowing it. <laughs> Who knows? At that point, were you considering making this? Yeah, we, we, did, we did give some thought to that. Uh, and uh, she, she was pregnant, and it seemed reasonable. Maybe we should stay in for a year until... Uh, 19, June 1946, I think, was the date we figured, and see how it, how it went and whether we liked this peacetime military and, and how things settled out, whether we are going to go back into the Depression or not. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of Depression thinking. Uh, and uh, so ultimately what we did was we flipped a coin to see whether we should stay in. Uh, heads, we used our heads and stayed in, and tails, we'd, uh, we'd take tail and leave. And it uh, came down heads. And she looked at me and she said, you want to try for two out of three? <laughs> <laughs> we started fresh and had to do three out of five before we got out. It just sounded like endless bridge parties with the officers' wives. Yeah, it just didn't appeal to her. So I, I apologized to Steed. I, I said, my wife is pregnant, you know, and she needs to be with her mother. And uh, so he understood. <laughs> he was a nice guy. What were you discharged uh, oh, October 1st or 2nd, I guess it was October 2nd, 1945, and uh, then was on terminal leave until December 21st. And at that time, I went on inactive service. The terminal leave kept me on active service until when they paid me off, they paid me right through December 21st. So. Do you uh, recall um, your feelings when you found out about the death of President Roosevelt? Yeah, I felt bad. It's too bad. How about the dropping the atomic bombs? Felt it was uh, it was going out to the field, and the woman next door leaned out of her door, and she said, "We'd been talking about atomic energy." She'd asked me for something about it just within the week, and uh, she leaned out the door and she said, "Did you see what they did with your bombs or with your atoms?" Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I said, "No," and she said, "They they made a bomb." And uh, I, uh, I heard what had happened. I thought that they probably could just as well have made the same demonstration by blowing the top off of Fujiyama and, uh, uh, without killing a lot of people. But uh, maybe not. I don't know. It's hard to second guess that kind of thing. Uh, it certainly, I think, if we had had the patience, would have been quite possible for us to have blockaded the islands to have sat 
for six months without killing any more people and let them get to the starvation point where they, uh, where they simply wanted to give up. But uh, uh, that, that, uh, that's expensive. And uh, keeping a, a war, a series of armies and navies and so on uh, gathered together in, in that kind of a situation for that long a time would be, I think, be impossible politically. So they, uh, they pretty well had to bring it to a climax of some kind, and maybe that was the climax, I don't know. It's the way, it's the way it happened, so it's the way it happened. Mm -hmm. Did you ever make use of the GI Bill? Yeah, I, uh, I worked for the news press in Fort Myers, Florida as classified ad manager, and they, uh, they uh, sucked at the federal tip, as many employers did. Uh, they needed to have me, and they would have had me anyway, but they decided they could save money by doing it, and so uh, they preferred me to somebody else who was skilled because they could get me cheap because they got the federal supplement. Did was, you uh, make use of the 5220 clock at all? No. 5220, that sounds familiar. $20 I can't a week for 52 weeks. Oh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> Um, did you ever stay in contact with anyone? A little bit by, uh, by Christmas cards. Uh, we stayed in touch with a, another uh, a navigator, another officer that I served with, uh, Irwin Barnett. Frankie. Hmm? Frankie. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I didn't stay in touch with him. Uh, I'm trying to think of the ones that I stayed in touch with. Uh, we yeah, we did Christmas cards with uh, I guess we did Christmas cards with uh, Paul Ryder for a while. Uh, there were uh, uh, several others that we had desultory contacts with. And, uh, Art Wright, uh, for instance, uh, we had uh, continuing contacts Fred with. Potter. Hmm? Fred Potter. And Fred Potter, yeah. But uh, then uh, then in 1990, uh, on a Saturday morning, I got a phone call. I'm uh, voice says I'm looking for uh, uh, John von Squike, who uh, served in uh, Guadalcanal in the uh, Air Force, in the B-25s. And I said, uh, yes, this is John von Squike. Who was this? And he said, Frank Howell. And I said, Frankie? And Sally said, you mean Frankie Howell? <laughs> Frankie meant Frankie Howell. It's sort of like when I, when I finally located Paul Nadler, I decided to do that in about 1995 or 96. I've been sort of stimulated by uh, Frank, but uh, uh, not that quickly. And uh, I tried to look up the other enlisted men, uh, struck out. Uh, but uh, called up, said, I'm looking for a Paul Nadler who was raised in Philadelphia and who served in the B-26s in the Solomon Islands and was married to a woman named Elsie. And the woman's voice said this, well, my name is Elsie. Who was this? And I said, John Van Skoik. And she said, Paul, it's Van. That was 58 years later, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, or no, 50, 53 years later. Memories stay green mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, that's one of the interesting things. How do you think your time in uh, service affected or changed your life? Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was trapped by the woman of my dreams. <laughs> Uh, the whole of my life has been colored by my, uh, has been determined by, mm -hmm. by that, uh, no question. It, it changed my life. Now, for the better? <laughs> Don't do that here. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for your Thank you. Good. You didn't tell them about the lemon. Oh, yes, I didn't. We got a minute? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. The plane I flew overseas, I had difficulty with. There were troubles in the in the uh, in the states, uh, hydraulic leaks, uh, uh, electronic tr problems, uh, fuel problems, fuel feed problems. Uh, we had the trouble in the uh, in the air as we uh, as we go to Hawaii with the right car carburetor. We barely get there. Uh, we uh, we have a hatch blow off on Canton Island because. Uh, Somebody. Oh, we had a generator go bad on uh, on Christmas Island. Then we had this hatch blow off on uh, Canton Island. We got down to Fiji. They decide to put back the radar, and they find that the radar has been not detached, but has been cut. They have to rewire the whole thing to get it back in. And uh, so, uh, 
here at the plane sits. It's uh, it's radar equipped, and so they are tr waiting to see if there's any ever any need for a radar search plane in a B-25 squadron or group. They don't, and after a year, they decide that they will convert it to a strafer, and uh, so they take out the radar, and they uh, they put in the machine guns and do all those retrofits that they they did at the depot and down down in. Uh, Tantura in uh, New Caledonia. And it comes up to the squadron in January of 1944, a year, almost a year later. And in either the end of January or beginning of February, after a year, the plane finally flies its first mission. Ross Lemon is the pilot, and he goes out on a night harassing mission. No bomb site, but you don't need a bomb site for a harassing mission. All you can do is drop, drop bombs and keep people awake. He goes out, never comes back. Nobody knows whether he was down by weather or by aircraft or what, any aircraft. Uh, but here is this lemon of an airplane flown by pilot lemon, and it is one shot. <laughs> it couldn't kill me. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was at 1900 and the class of 191 because he couldn't do math. He got appointed. He got he got appointed. He got appointed and ran the plebe year. Is that that's the first year? First year, yes. Yeah. And uh, and washes out in the spring, and he takes the exams again that summer and gets reappointed, and goes back in and he still fails in math. And by that time, it's 1898. And what are we doing? We're fighting the Japanese, or the Spaniards in Cuba and in the Philippines. And they post him to the Philippines in August of, uh, of uh, 1898 and is there on the insurrection, putting down the uh, freedom move fighters of, uh, of, uh, of the time. And uh, it's one of those cases where our military was used for bad reasons. We've done it many times since, and uh, so uh, he distinguished himself uh, with his uh, searches for Aguinaldo and people of that sort. And uh, on one one occasion, uh, which I tell about in the book, uh, he uh, he got uh, he got wounded, and uh, was was gallant. But uh, he never felt that that was worthy of the Congressional Medal. He told my mother that uh, she called me that uh, he thought that uh, the reason why they'd given him the Congressional Medal of Honor was because they needed a hero to hold up to the people to make this unpopular war a little more popular. And uh, he didn't he didn't deny that that he had served honorably and well, mm -hmm. and that it hadn't been gallantry. But he didn't think it was worthy of the Congressional Medal. But, uh, but that's been squawk anyway. <laughs> we tend to be a little bit that way. Where's the medal? Oh, I've got, I've got, uh, I got some of his lapel. I don't think I've got the medal. Probably. I, it probably, it probably is in the Philippines somewhere. Uh, he probably kept yeah. that. See, he, was, he and his wife were taken prisoners. They, she was uh, she was interned in uh, in Santo Tomas uh, concentration camp during the uh, uh, during the occupation, and he was in Bilibid prison as a former military person, and had a stroke in prison, and died three days after being liberated by the by our forces. And she got to see him, uh, and uh, I don't know what that was worth, except it maybe made her feel better. Uh, she went back to settle in in the uh, Baguio after the war, after she came back to the States. Uh, she was a Kellogg, and, uh, and Will Kellogg, the breakfast food king, mm -hmm. you know, went out to, uh, to California and, and met her and made sure that she was okay and took her to, uh, to department stores to get her outfitted with clothes. And, uh, and she refused to, uh, uh, to buy clothes that fitted. She was only about 65 or maybe 70 pounds by that time. And she says, I'm going to be heavier again. I'm, going to buy, I'm not going to waste money on having to get new clothes. So uh, she, uh, she got all that kind of stuff and stayed in the States for a little while and then went back to the Philippines and uh, found that it just wasn't the same without Lou 
and with the expatriates who had formerly lived in Baguio scattered and many of them dead. Uh, so she came back uh, to the States and settled in, uh, in uh, Arizona and uh, outside of Phoenix and, and died there at the age of 19, uh, I guess she was 94 when she died in the 1970s. So she, was, uh, she was a vegetarian as all the Kelloggs were. Mm -hmm. Uh, John was a Kellogg, you know, he ran the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Uh, she had one child and was, uh, was uh, on return to the States. She had it in the Philippines. The child apparently was what my mother called a blue baby, uh, apparently a congenital heart defect. And she was on her way back on board ship uh, to uh, the Presidio uh, to San Francisco when, uh, to take him to uh, Battle Creek. Uh, when the child died, and who was buried in the Presidio Cemetery, it was the only child they had. So then the